Welcome back everyone. Today we're going to talk about working with co-packers and this is a question that I get not only from students in our programs at Niagara College but also from a lot of small business out in the Canadian food manufacturing sector. I'm really in a privileged situation working at Niagara College as I do where I get to work with many young food science leaders who are interested in establishing new businesses but I also um, worked on founding the Research and Innovation Centre back in 2012, which is now the Canadian Food and Wine Institute Innovation Centre. And that attracts a lot of small business, and many of those small businesses still uh, still pick up the phone and call me and ask a lot of questions. And I feel that it's an important role that I play as a public educator to help small business find solutions. Um, I also volunteer extensively with the Community Institute of Food Science and Technology, and many people know that uh, small business development is one of my key portfolio areas, so I do get a lot of questions about this. So I'm hoping that this, this slide presentation will give a lot of high-level information about how do you go about working with co-packers so that you can start on that exploration yourself. So at the end of this video, you'll be able to define what co-packers can do for small food manufacturing businesses, and actually for large food manufacturing businesses as well. It's not just small business that co-packs. In many cases, large businesses do as well. We'll explain the process of identifying a co-packer for your product, and we'll actually go through and look at some of the databases that are out there. We'll discuss the types of negotiations that go on within co-packing relationships, and we'll talk about some of the positives and negatives and make sure that you are protected in that process. We'll define some of the information found on term sheets, and justify the role of legal contracts and co-packing to protect your intellectual property and rights within the co-packing agreement. So, honestly, it's important to think about protecting your property and protecting your standing when going into these relationships. So, what is co-packing? Well, it's contract manufacturing. And the, in, a, in essence, if I owned a factory and I had excess capacity, it makes sense for me as the factory owner to rent that space and time out so that I'm maximizing the um, maximizing the utilization of my facility. And as a small business, it is a really great opportunity for me to get my product manufactured without having to invest in the physical premises and the human resources and the equipment to make sure that the concept that I want to make actually has viability within the marketplace. It's much lower risk. Now, many, many times large companies will co-pack as well. One, it's a chance for them to expand their capacity. If, if they have products that they'd like to manufacture and their own manufacturing capacity is maximized, then they can leverage co-packing as an opportunity to make more. Or it's a chance for large companies to trial out new products and they haven't invested in the capital for that. In many cases, co-packing is how entire business units have uh, functioned. So, for example, many of the private label grocery brands, uh, President's Choice, Kirkland, Sensations, the new one uh, with Sobeys, Panache, these are all co-packing private label uh, relationships that the grocery retailers have established. And it's a chance for them to have competitive brands within the same space as many of the mainstream uh, national brands, but at a lower price point because of the lower advertising revenue and the lower R&D revenue that's necessary. So back to this, uh, we're, in essence, it's a, it's a contractual relationship that um, one company is renting someone else's facility, equipment and human resources to make a food product. It, co-packing does exist in other, in other uh, manufactured goods as well. It is very relationship oriented. I can't stress this enough. You can't just go out there and tell a company what to do. Um, all the money in the world isn't going to set up a good relationship. You have to think about a lot of the nuance that's involved and make sure that it's a proper fit from a whole variety of different dimensions. And this is something that I've, I've uh, 
helped rationalize with a number of small businesses where they go, well, of course it's going to be easy to find a co-packer. Well, it's not always easy. In many cases, you have to have a bit of give and take in that relationship to be able to make sure that it's possible. And in, in, in some really innovative products, co-packing just doesn't exist because the innovation is so related to um, the unit operations, the equipment that's involved, and the skilled human resources necessary to pull it off. And so co-packing isn't for every company. It's just not possible because some products are just so innovative. So why co-packing? As a facility owner, it's that chance to use unused manufacturing capacity. You can diversify your revenue streams and grow your expertise and company maturity by running new products. What does that mean? Well, if you've only made one product for a long period of time, you, you can start to get into a bit of a comfort zone. And, and it's really good to continuously learn and challenge your human resources to try new things and to learn new technologies to increase the maturity of the company. So as a facility, it's a good opportunity. And in some cases, depending on the situation, you could own most of the unit operations and perhaps you buy in one or two unit operations to fulfill a co-packing agreement. It's a chance to diversify and to mitigate out that cost of uh, branching into new uh, manufacturing modes. So as a food manufacturer, it's a chance to leverage ideas in a more nimble way. So as I mentioned before, small business is able to get their ideas on the shelf without having to go and purchase all of the physical uh, the physical plant to pull this off. You can innovate without the commit without that commitment to the physical infrastructure. It's a great means of doing test marketing for new ideas and this is what oftentimes large business is doing and it's it's a much lower barrier to entry. So there are a lot of questions that you do need to determine before you go into a co-packing. The first and foremost is what is the minimum order quantity that I, as a business owner, want to do? And what's the facility's minimum order quantity? And this is the uh, usually the first question that I ask small businesses to ask. Oftentimes they'll come in and they'll say, oh, you know what, I want to make a thousand units. A thousand units for some of these co-packers is like five minutes worth of production. It doesn't make financial sense for those co-packers to go into that scale of fabrication. And so making sure that there's a match between typical minimum order quantities is, is one of the biggest stickling points that I have when helping small business negotiate. You've got to find a decent match that the, the manufacturer's minimum order is going to be relative to what the small business is willing to do. And again, small business often um, needs uh, a bit of a pat on the back and a bit of a reality check to understand what typical grocery minimum order quantities are going to be. You have to think about the whole business plan. So, for example, I've had lots of small business come in and say, hey, you know what, I'd like to launch to Moblas in eastern Canada. Well, you need to think what is a case order quantity, what is the frequency of that case order quantity, and how many grocery retailers is it going to, to then think what does a single order look like. And in many cases, that single order could be tens of thousands of units, thousands of cases, and the small business needs to be prepared to front the cost of those thousands of cases on the front end. And many times those small businesses don't realize that they are going to be on the hook for thousands, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of units of product before they've sold anything. And you have to front the cost of that up front. So do be aware of what your minimum order quantity is as a small business, but also think about it in the context of your sales uh, projection. Where are you trying to target your sales? And does that minimum order quantity align? Do you have the financing to be able to fill that? Another key question that um, I face with a lot of small business as they're going about negotiating co-packing is the aspect of certifications. So for example, um, you can't go in and tell a, uh, a bakery company that you want to make a meat product if that company is not established as a meat processing licensed facility. Same with dairy. You can't go in and make dairy products in a non-dairy licensed facility. 
uh, there's there's certain exemptions, but small business needs to realize that, for example, alcohol manufacturing, you can't just go into any bottling facility and say, I want to make alcohol. No, that facility has to be licensed as an alcohol manufacturer. Um, kosher certification, halal certification, all of these different certifications are absolutely critical to the type of licensed manufacturing that goes on. And so you do need to think about what sort of requirements are there. Also, the other piece of the puzzle is things like Safe Food for Canadians regulation and preventive control plans. So, for example, um, we get many small companies. Uh, let's say you're a, a small farm and you want to make jam and there's a commercial kitchen that says, oh, yeah, of course, we'll be able to make your jam for you. Fantastic. Now, let's say you've got a mail order program and you are shipping your jam across Canada and into the United States. Well, suddenly you are doing interprovincial trade and actually exporting your product. And now you actually have to have a Safe Food for Canadians Act preventive control program within the facility. And that commercial kitchen may not have been prepared to fulfill that. These are the sorts of certifications that you need to think of within projections on your business plan. Is your plan to just sell jam at the farmer's market and in some local retailers? Or are you going online and going to start shipping by mail order across the country? These are key questions within your business plan that you need to be aware of. Also, what sort of validation evidence does the process provide when it comes to food safety? And this is a question I get a lot. Oftentimes, there are generic commercial kitchens that have equipment and they're ambitious and they want to make product. But I think of um, I think of some companies that have gotten into meat processing and they are they're doing it at a municipal level. But are they doing the right sort of uh, time and temperature tracking and have the right sanitation protocols in place? to uh, fulfill the uh, meat processing requirements. If they're doing it at a municipal level, it implies that they're only selling direct to customers and no business-to-business uh, -business transactions. And so a municipal meat, uh, like a butcher counter or so on, can do uh, direct-to-customer transactions, but they can't do business-to-business -business transactions. Otherwise, they have to become a provincial plant and have a preventive control program in place. So... The moment you have those preventive control programs in place, you have to show validation evidence to say we've got listeria control and staphylococcus control and salmonella control and we have lethality tracking. All of these requirements change and shift substantially. So understanding, does the company have a really good quality control program? Do they have a really good food safety program? And is it relative to the scale of sales that I'm going to be doing as a small business or as a large business? That's really important. The last point that I have here is packaging styles. Oftentimes I have uh, small business clients coming and say, oh, well, I want to make it and I want to put it in this magical box or this can or this special uh, glassware that I found on, uh, found on Alibaba. And this is a really important point. And not all co-manufacturers have the same packaging capabilities. And so, for example, if you are a beverage manufacturer, you may have only the capabilities of putting beverages into cans. And those cans may be only a very specific size. Why? The equipment and the chucks for sealing those cans are very specific and somewhat expensive. And so you don't just go magically switching cans out for different sizes and styles of cans. Same with bottles. Bottles can't just be interchanged willy-nilly. There are special chucks and special filling heads, and those are sized very specifically to, uh, to the glassware. And so I have had many ambitious small businesses come and say, oh, well, what if we were to put it in this wonderful um, magical bottle with wacky glass and all sorts of fun features? Well, if you can't find a company that has the mechanics to be able to fill those bottles, you're going to be hand filling and that's going to be increasing your cost. Likewise, there are so many companies who are coming and say, oh, well, I'd like to make soup. And you go, you go, well, what's the pH? What's the water activity? And you realize 
they don't understand that soup may need to be retort processed because of Clostridium botulinum. And as such, that packaging style links out to all sorts of other uh, unit operations that are necessary to be able to fulfill that product the way that is seemed fit. So it's, it's important to think about the whole system. What are the unit operations, the quality systems, and the packaging capabilities all linked together to be able to make the justification, is this facility going to be sufficient for what I need? Okay, so we've we've asked and answered some of those high level questions. Well, let's go and look at some of these databases. Um, I'm just going to again. I always joke we're friends at this point. Let's just jump right out. Oh, there's some photos. Ah. So first off, I I I can't stress this enough. First off, before you get into co packing, do some sort of competitive analysis and and have an understanding of who's already in the game. Uh, with respect to the types of products that you're already or that you want to be making, it may be immensely evident who your co-packer is going to be. Canada's in a unique situation from a co-packing perspective because we have a lot of smaller sized companies. The companies that we have in Canada are on the uh, very small size compared to American companies. And so many American companies come to Canada for co-packing. Vice versa, there are some capabilities that we just, um, despite all of the searches that we've done, we can't find in Canada. And so many times companies are going to the United States for manufacturing and then um, importing the product back into Canada. Here's one database and it's called Specialty Food Co-Packers Directory. And it's, it's a pretty straightforward directory. I want to go into the directory. Let's see what I want to make. What do I want to make today? Ice cream? I've been making ice cream with my... Um, with my students for a while and it's pretty straightforward um, each of these different links here nice thing is I can find companies that are all over North America in this database and the thing is don't stop here when it comes to the research do take the time and double check other things such as um, SFCR certification uh, so safe Food for Canadians Act or regulation requirements, double check their uh, provincial or federal licenses for dairy manufacturing. Um, look them up in the GFSI databases to see it, what sort of certifications they have in place. From here, I may be able to find, here we go, we've got custom co-packing on ice cream. These guys are in Canada. They are BRC certified. They're certified, certificated, what on earth? <laughs> Good British word. Um, so they've got custom co-packing. They've got some contact information here. Oftentimes they're not going to show all of the detail that's out there, but what I can do from a competitive analysis perspective is take a look and see what sort of products they are making right now. I see there's sorbet, there's frozen yogurt, there's sugar-free ice creams. There's different grades of ice cream in terms of uh, likely uh, cost competitiveness in terms of the ingredient declarations, I can find out a lot of information just by looking in there. So that was the, pardon me, we were looking at specialtyfoodcopackers.com. In Ontario, at Food and Beverage Ontario, they have established a co-packing portal. And this is... Um, it's pretty straightforward. Let's say I have an existing product. The nice thing is, in some cases, if you are working with a co-packer, let's say you are a small business and it's a product you've never made. In many cases, these co-packers have R&D expertise and you can contract them. You can pay them to do some of the initial development. You walk in with a really good specification and they can help refine that product under the, under the understanding that they are going to be the co-packer of note. So let's say I want to make dairy and I want to make ice cream. It will let me pick my packaging. So let's say 500 ml tubs. They do want a minimum order requirement. Here we go. We've got one Shaw's ice cream. So it's what's interesting is that it's going to give me different leads on each of these different strategies. Now, what if I was to just go Google no, I don't need to type Google. 
Ice Cream Co-Packing Ontario. And there we go. Reed's Dairy, Prairie West Ice Cream, Specialty... Or that's the database that we were just looking at. Central Smith we just looked at, GS Gelato, uh, Cumberland Dairy. All of it... Oftentimes, honestly, it is as easy as doing that Google search. Honestly, is a little bit of... <laughs> it almost feels like dating in many respects when it comes to establishing that co-packing relationship. Let's jump back to the slideshow here. So we, we've gone through and done some initial sheet, uh, initial searches, pardon me, term sheets. As you start to establish what's going on, you do want to make sure you have non-disclosure agreement in place before doing any of the hardcore negotiation because you may need to reveal your formulations. You may need to reveal your uh, processing parameters. So do make sure that you have a non-disclosure in place before you reveal all that information. As you move forward in the relationship and get closer to setting, setting up an agreement, you will want to set up a term sheet. I've seen a lot of small, co or small business go into co-packing and they don't have a term sheet in place. They just have a, a gentleman's agreement. Someone goes in and shakes hands with the owner and says, hey, yeah, make my sauce for me or make my, make my uh, apple juice or ice cream or whatever. You want to have a term sheet and that's going to set up your legal requirements on that co-packing relationship. So first off, minimum order requirements. In some cases, co-packers may say, um, here's our standard minimum order batch. They may also have recurring manufacturing uh, requirements. So you will manufacture X number of times per month or X number of times per year um, to establish uh, stability within their production forecasting. There, You want to make sure there's some sort of change order procedure. So for example, if the co-packer needs to um, make ingredient substitutions or do some sort of change to your product specification. Who has the capability of doing those change orders? And if you're doing change orders, do you as the business owner come in and oversee that sort of change order or do you authorize the um, co-packer to do that for you? Another important one to focus on is ownership on traceability and recall. Obviously, when you're manufacturing, you have insurance in place and your co-packer should have insurance in place. Um, but... If you were to have some sort of traceability or recall procedure in place, who oversees that? Is that going to be the co-packer or is that going to be you as the um, contractor? It's important to note the difference. And if you, for some reason, have to withdraw a large amount of product and hold it within a warehouse on disposition, you need to decide who's going to be warehousing that product as well. And... Uh, another piece of the puzzle, who's going to be doing, uh, who's going to be establishing the product, product testing requirements and who's going to be performing the product testing, what frequency and who's covering off those costs. Um, oftentimes when doing co-packing, some of these hidden costs are hard to establish and it's, it's something that you really want to make sure is clarified because I've seen a uh, small business go in and have product manufactured, but then the co-packer says, well, it was up to the small business to establish the testing regimen and send out product for microbial testing. And then there's a recall issue related to spoilage or quality issue. And nobody knows who was responsible for doing the product testing. These are the... Uh, the sorts of high level questions. There are resources available and I do highly recommend taking a look at some of the resources. Those of you who are taking the course with me, you'll find those resources I've shared with you in Blackboard. And if you're not taking the course with me, do reach out to me and I can redirect you. But um, do ask a lot of questions before signing off on some sort of manufacturing contract. Last but not least, uh, let's just do some um, quick review on some of the common issues that I see. Packaging alignment. Again, I can't stress this enough. Many small businesses want to make something and they can't find a co-packer that's going to use the packaging that they really want to do. Oftentimes, um, a small business will have developed out a, a bench scale prototype and they'll have a packaging and they'll have gone ahead and ordered packaging and Meanwhile, there's no co-packer that's capable of managing that packaging. Don't jump ahead into designing your 
packaging until you have established who your co-packer is and what their packaging capabilities are. They may even have requirements on um, the types of labels that they can apply within their equipment. They may have requirements on um, different glassware or um, cans or pouches or other types of packaging that their equipment is capable of handling. And you've got to be able to have some sort of consensus. Do not go and order all your packaging and labels until you've had that dialogue. Do have the dialogue on ownership of formulation. And I can't stress this enough. I see it too often where a small business hasn't signed off on a proper term sheet and hasn't decided who owns the formulation. And when those inevitable changes occur, where let's say a supplier needs to be switched or cost of goods on something is uh, changing and perhaps the manufacturer has availability on a discounted larger bulk from a different supplier. If these sorts of changes are occurring, who owns the change and who owns the formulation and who needs to oversee those sorts of uh, changes? So you can't have, uh, you need to establish the, the ground rules. If the co-packer is going to go ahead and make a change, do you need to come in and observe that change as the small business owner? Do you need to have an R&D team uh, evaluate that change and the implications before you proceed on manufacturing? And if there's uh, enough incremental changes to the formulation, does the co-packer have any sort of ownership on that formulation? Do make sure that you understand the process control requirements. I can't stress this enough. I've seen too many small businesses come in and say, oh, I want to make this and I want to make that. And they don't understand things like Clostridium botulinum or um, alcohol manufacturing requirements or all sorts of different things. Small business owners are wonderful and they're the backbone of our sector. But do make sure that you are having a fulsome dialogue with uh uh, food manufacturing experts and food scientists who have the capability of discussing what is possible and not possible. You can't go in and make something that is fundamentally going to be unsafe. You can't go in and make something in a establishment that does not have the proper licenses. Do take the time to talk about licensing and traceability requirements, especially think about what your business plan is going to be and Think in the short term, but also in the long term. And if there's going to be problems having to switch over co-packers, oftentimes um, small business will go in and say, oh, well, you know what? I'm going to make this in the uh, local community kitchen. Things go well and they grow out to a, a secondary, uh, slightly larger co-packer, but it's still a municipal co-packer. And then the business explodes and you need SFCR or you need um, foreign supplier verification for FISMA. And these small businesses aren't necessarily capable of managing that sort of traceability and licensing. Do make sure to fulfill that. Last but not least, co-packing isn't for everyone. Um, in some cases, products are so unique and the unit operations are so unique that you can't find the type of expertise. Or in other cases, perhaps the equipment or the expertise is there, but it's such a unique formulation that it doesn't make sense to walk into a co-packer that fundamentally is a competitor within the same space. If, if they're making stuff on the same machines, they're likely making similar product. Does it make more sense as a small business to not co-pack, but instead buy the equipment and use accelerator space? Accelerator space is rental, is rental manufacturing space. It, more or less, it's the empty shell of a building. With the, with the bare minimum, uh, in the case of food processing acceleration space, it's usually an empty food processing space with water, with sanitation, with electrical and uh, gas hookups. But otherwise, you bring in the equipment that you see fit. And does it make more sense to, instead of building out a relationship potentially with a competitor that um, maybe has more mobility to take over and instead use acceleration space or... In some cases, actually build your own build your own facility and grow from there. Do take the time to think about your business plan and establish what's correct for you. All right, I think that's it for me. Yes, it is. So you know where to find me. You know where to ask questions. You know I love all of you and love to hear from you. And 
keep asking good questions, keep on learning. Take care and we'll talk to you soon.